Amen. Well, go ahead and have a seat. We're going to sing a lot more tonight, but we're going to open God's Word. I'm going to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 12, and we are going to dig into the Scriptures. We live in a culture that loves stories, but it's nothing new. You know, there, there's a lot of people in our world now that they, they learn better by listening, they learn better by watching a story, uh, that, you know, read, that reading's not as popular as it used to be because we have so many other vehicles for hearing stories. But stories lock truths into our minds. And so we're going to start this whole year at nights of worship. All we're going to do is each night of worship, I'm going to tell you a story. It's going to be story time. But i got to tell you in advance, for full disclosure, I'm taking all the stories from Jesus. <laughs> Because Jesus loved to tell stories. He understood that stories locked truths in people's hearts. So this whole, this whole year, we're going to be looking at the parables of Jesus and, and listening to those stories and hearing those stories, but then letting them capture our hearts and grab our imagination and lock truth into our minds and then ultimately transform our lives. Because when you really understand the message of Jesus and the stories he was telling, they're transformational. So we're going to be talking uh, tonight about the rich fool, and I'm calling the message a heavenly perspective on stuff. A heavenly perspective on stuff. But I want to think first about how stories shape our outlook and our attitude. So I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about three stories, and maybe for some of you, maybe you have heard these stories, and they lock something in your mind. So here's the first one. What do you learn from this story? Go and look at the screens there. What do you learn from this story? Go ahead, bring up the image there. I can describe it. There we go. Okay. Now, who knows what story that is? Now, some people may not have heard that story. When I was a little kid, I heard that story. My parents read us Grimm's fairy tales and those things, and not the, not the, the softened up versions. The old versions, the old school stories. Do you remember in this story, Little Red Riding Hood is going to visit who? Her grandmother. Someone comes along, and it's actually, it's actually the wolf, and, and um, finds out where she's going, and goes there ahead of her. And anybody remember what the wolf does to the grandma when it gets there? Well, either eats her or locks her in a closet, depending on whether you go the old version or the new version. <laughs> okay? <laughs> stories get maybe a little softer with time, a little bit more calm, a little friendlier, a little more, more gentler stories. Uh, and then Little Red Riding gets, gets there, and you know, grandma's snuggled up in the bed, and Little Red Riding Hood notices, she says, Grandma, what big eyes you have. They look different to me. And Grandma says, the better to see you with, my dear. And, what big, and, you know, and then finally goes, Grandma, what big, a big mouth or big teeth you have? And she says, the better to eat you with, my dear. There's a lessons there, right? <laughs> Be careful of strangers. Be careful if you see something suspicious. I just remember as a kid hearing that story, it didn't really scare me or freak me out, but it made me like, and you better be careful when you're at Grandma's house. <laughs> but there's lessons in these stories, and that's why they're told. Uh, does, what message grips your heart if you saw this movie, this story? So here, go to the next slide there. I don't know if we're, if I'm, is the system not working? The system is lagging. The system is lagging. Okay. Well, I, I'm not going to, oh, there you go. What message grips your heart? Because I know that the person doing the things is on the ball, but then, okay, there you go. So this, this was Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Rings. I remember a scene in that movie that I'll never forget. I went back and watched it again as I was preparing this message and to, to see, and, and you know what? It was exactly the way I remembered it, even though I hadn't seen that for a couple of years. And it's a scene where they're trying to decide who's going to take the ring up to have it destroyed, and everyone's fighting. I'm not going to let an elf carry that one, and the dwarves and the elves are fighting, and, the people, and then a little hobbit, Frodo, walks up and says, I'll take it. I'll take it. It's this impossible task, this certain death task, and the smallest among them says, I'll do it. And then one by one, other ones said, I'll go with you, and I'll go with you. And, I'll go. and then finally, three more hobbits kind of stumble in. And there's nine of them. And there's a line, this is the fellowship of the ring. I don't know why, for me, at that moment, that sense of what is it like in your life in the hardest of times where there's a group of people around you who say, I will stand with you, I will walk with you, I will be with you. And it's just like it, that, that moment in that movie captured my heart. And when I watched it again, it was that same thing. It's like, oh, that's, that's life. Whatever the challenge is, whatever the journey is, if you're with other people who will stand beside you, you can make it through. And, and so th there's those moments. I don't know if we're still lagging. We'll try, we'll try one more. Does this message still need to be heard? There we go. It looks like it's going quicker. And now, anybody remember this story? Let me know what this story is. I'll get it up there in a second. 
the emperor's new clothes. All right? See, see how the emperor, if you look closely, is not fully clothed at all. Uh, and they got a guy there blocking the, blocking the view, so we're okay. Uh, this is PG shoreline, okay? We're going to be, be good here. But this, this story, and I was talking to somebody earlier who said, I don't know that story. So you got to read that story. You got to get to know that story. Because there's a point where people say, oh, this is the way it is. This is the way it is. And everyone's buying it. And everyone realizes it's not really that way, but nobody says anything. And then finally, the emperor's marching through town, and everyone has been told that if they're dignified, if they're intelligent, if they're wise, they'll see the beauty of these clothes. Only fools can't see what's really there. So they're all acting like they don't want to be considered a fool. They're all acting like the emperor isn't beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. What royal garments. And a little kid says, he's naked. <laughs> and everybody goes, oh. And the truth is known. Stories that lock truths in your mind. Here's the difference with Jesus' stories. His stories take spiritual truths they don't just lock them in your mind. He locks them in your soul. He locks something into the soul and the core of who you are. And Jesus' stories, if you hear them told well, if you listen to them and let them sink into your soul, you know, in, in your, you know, through your ears, into your mind, into your heart, but then into your soul, it can, they can change you forever. They're spiritual truths you will never forget when you understand the stories of Jesus. So, Lord, this is our prayer as we kick off into this new year. Whether we, and, and, Lord, I know that tonight many of our people... Uh, I got a number of texts today from people who said we're, we're coming tonight online for different reasons, but Lord, whether we're online at home, whether we're gathered here on our campus, whether we're outdoors or indoors, Lord, we pray that through this year, Jesus, your words and your stories would be riveted and locked to our souls, that we would be different people because we've heard your truth revealed through your stories and that you'll transform us to be more who you want us to be. Lord, make this adventure this year of walking through these stories you told a life-changing adventure. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, the parables of Jesus are as needed and as powerful as ever. We need those stories today like we did in the past. So look with me at Luke chapter 12, and we're going to look at just one story. Uh, we're going to open up God's Word look at one story, but what happens in this passage, starting in verse 12... Uh, sorry, starting in chapter 12, verse 13 through 21, there's a little bit of intro setting the scene... And there's a little bit of an outro. And the story's kind of packed in the five verses in the middle are the actual story. So just listen to God's word. If you have your Bible or your Bible app open, follow along. It'll be on the screens as well. And listen to this story. And as I'm, as I'm reading the story, ask yourself, what's the heartbeat of what Jesus is getting at? What is Jesus trying to teach us? Or better yet, what is Jesus wanting to teach me? Because there's a lesson here for each one of us. Well, someone in the crowd said to Jesus, said to him, Teacher, rabbi, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, this isn't the parable yet. This is just what was going on, the setting of the parable, right? So Jesus is in a crowd, and somebody yells out, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Uh, and, and then, at that point, Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? Then he said to them, now this is where the, the kind of the, framework and warning comes. He still hasn't gotten to the story yet, all right? Then, then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. So now you got the framework? This guy's asking, Jesus, settle this dispute I have. And Jesus kind of gives a little preamble. You know, gives a little warning, gives a little teaching, and now he tells them a story. And then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. I mean, it's bumper crop time. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I shall say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Oh, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? End of parable. And then Jesus says, This is how it will be with whoever stores up for themselves but is not rich toward God. That's the story. That's the setting. That's the intro and the outro. So let's just walk through the story together. Let's kind of, let's kind of unpack the story. And I need to check and see. The countdown clock says I have five minutes left in my sermon. 
So whoever's in charge of that, find out what I really have because I'll go all night if someone doesn't stop me. It's just how I roll. And so uh, make sure that we figure out what I should have left on that clock. Thank you. I don't know what it is, but I know it's not five minutes and five seconds. All right. So first, the context. All right? When, when every, you know, every text in the Bible has a context. Every parable has a setting. Don't just read the parable. Get what's going on around it so you understand the setting in which this story is being told. All right? And so uh, the, the context It's a request for Jesus to be the rabbinical advocate. In the ancient world, rabbis would often be pulled into situations to help people deal with disputes. In the ancient world, there weren't really courts. There was a city gate, and there were elders that would hang out in the city gate, and people would bring their their arguments, their concerns, and they'd bring them to that setting sometimes, or to a rabbi. So Jesus is here in this crowd, and somebody calls up, but they're not really asking Jesus to to do sort of a, a balanced evaluation. They're basically saying, Jesus, be on my side and tell my brother what I want my brother to hear. They're asking Jesus not, not so much to be a judge as much as to be the jury and to, make, you know, to agree with them. That's the context. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Obviously, the brother didn't want to, and he wanted it now, and he's saying, agree with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? Now, what's going on here, and you can see it, is that there, there's obviously, because of the story Jesus tells, there's an issue of greed. This one brother is saying, I want what's mine, I want it now. And there was probably a sense that it really wasn't his at this point, but he wanted it. So so Jesus kind of looks beyond and sees his heart and says there's a need for a spiritual lesson here. Now, let me tell you something about any time Jesus teaches a spiritual lesson. If you look at that particular lesson and you say to yourself, oh, good, this is one of those lessons from Jesus I don't need. I got this one nailed down already. You probably need the lesson. You following me? Whenever you feel like, oh, this, I've mastered this one. I'm really, I, I, th- there's, there's always something to be learned. Here's something I've learned as a pastor. Through my years in ministry, I will tell you honestly that occasionally people criticize or critique pastors. It just happens occasionally, okay? Uh, when it happens, early in my ministry, my response was to get defensive. As the years went by, my response was to stop and say, okay, even if they're mean and out of line and not doing it very well, there may be truth in what they're saying. And I could maybe learn something. And so I try to listen and learn. If I will do that from a person who's broken and frail and sinful, how much more should I listen to what Jesus has to say? Can I get an amen? Right? And so when you hear a story of Jesus, don't too quickly go, oh, good, this one's not for me. Pause and say, Jesus, how might this be for me? Always. And if you do, you will learn something new. And God will do something new in your heart. And probably in some way, he'll transform your life. And so the the context is there's a request for Jesus to take this rabbinical role of Deciding between them, but really coming on this guy's side, he's asking Jesus to work for him. Now, Jesus sets the table. Before Jesus tells the story, he says a couple of things, and, and, and so I'm, I'm trying to not only read the passage, but I'm trying to kind of teach you how to read Scripture. If Jesus, before he tells a story, gives a couple of hints in advance, pay attention. If Jesus makes a couple of comments before the story, say, oh, wait, wait, what's he coming? Because he's, he might be priming the pump. He might be getting ready to say something, and he's kind of letting you know, here's what we're moving towards and preparing our hearts and our minds. So now, look at Jesus sets the table. Here's what he says. Then Jesus said to them, right before the parable, Jesus said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Does that sound like a warning? (laughs) When someone says, watch out, what should you do? Brilliant. See, I knew this group would get that. Some churches, no, but you... When someone says, watch out, you watch out, right? Jesus Jesus says, watch out. Be on your guard. Double watch out, right? Against all kinds of greed. Talking about greed of all kinds, including greed in our own hearts. And then Jesus kind of makes a declaration. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. So so Jesus says two things. I'm just, I mean, catch this. Before we even get to the parable, this guy has shown up. Jesus knows this is a moment to teach people about how to handle these things. So Jesus Jesus says, be on your guard, watch out for greed. And he says, life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Life is not all about how much stuff you have. So Jesus says this before he even tells the story. So be careful of greed of any sort. Beware of this mindset. More, 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 me, me, me. Let's say that together. One, two, three. More, 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 me, me, me. Jesus says, be careful, watch out. That's, that's, that's the greedy spirit. It says, I always want more. And my first thought when I have something is me. So Jesus gives the warning, 
right? And he says, life is not about how much stuff you have. And the question is, do you hear that message? Do you understand? Do you understand that life is more than your net worth? And, and a lot of times we're taught in our culture, in our world, your value is your net worth. How valuable are you? What kind of house do you have? Do you have a house at all? What kind of apartment do you have? What kind of car do you drive? What kind of clothes do you wear? That defines you. Jesus is saying, no, it doesn't. What defines you is not how much stuff you have. There's, there's things much bigger than that in this world. So before he even gets the parable, Jesus says, beware of greed and understand that your life is not made up of how much you have. Now he tells the story, all right? So we continue on in verse 16. And the whole parable, the simple story, the whole parable, the whole story is just five verses long. I mean, the whole story is five short verses. But no, just let this come alive in your heart and say, if, if I were there and Jesus were speaking the story, if I were listening, say, if I weren't saying, what does this say to somebody else? But I was daring to say, what does this say to me? What might I learn and how might I be changed if I understood the truth that Jesus is revealing? And Jesus told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man. So we know from before, the, before this happens, he's already rich, all right? The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. So now a rich guy is about to get what? Richer, right? Okay, it's yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, so now there's this internal dialogue, right? He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Hit the pause button there. He could have answered that question a hundred different ways. What shall I do? I could have a party for all the poor in our community. I could set up accounts for families that can't put their kids through school. I could, I could. And there's a thousand ways he could have answered this. But, so, so he's asking himself, you know, he said, what will I do? And he answers himself, I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And notice how many times the word I or me or myself is in here. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. Where's his focus here? Anybody picking up the subtle cues? Right? Right? And I'll say to myself, now he's going to talk to himself again, another internal dialogue. You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. And some of, you, some of you are going, yeah. That's what I'd do. <laughs> That's what I'd say. But Jesus is trying to kind of prick our conscience and make us wonder, is, that, is, this maybe the, is this the best way to respond? Verse 20. But God said to him. Now, when you read the scriptures, especially when you read them out loud, you, you, you can read them different ways and try to get the heartbeat and the sense of things. I think some people read this this way. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. <laughs> you know, that's how some people read that. I read it this way. I read it this way. But God said to him, oh, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who gets what you prepared for yourself? See the difference? I don't think God's yelling at him. I think God's saying, you missed it. You missed an opportunity to change the world around you. You missed an opportunity to leave a legacy. I don't read God's tone in this as anger. I read God's tone as, in that you had a moment, you could have made a difference, and you turned all to yourself, and then your life, and now remember, it's a story. This didn't really happen. Jesus, Jesus is crafting and telling a story from the wisdom of heaven to help us get a, a view of life. So that the next time we're doing really well and we get something extra, we might go, wait a minute. When, 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 when our internal dialogue starts going, I know what I'll do. <laughs> I know what I'm going to, yeah, yeah. And we, we go, wait a minute. Is that the best response? Jesus told these stories to lock truths into our souls to transform our lives. So just a couple of thoughts from this passage, from the story. It was a moment of plenty for someone who had plenty. It's a moment where somebody who had a lot got a lot more. And we're looking at how they responded. So we should say to ourselves, you know, when I have a lot, when I'm doing okay and I get more, how do I respond? What's my first response? There's an internal con conversation. So in the story, this guy's talking to himself. What shall I do? I got more. And his answer to himself is, I'll make sure I can keep it all for me. 
That's his answer. Now, this parable is not talking about don't plan for your grandkids' education, don't plan for your future, don't have a retirement account. That's not what this is talking about. It's trying to teach us a general concept of how we understand stuff. And if you have a lot of stuff and you get more stuff, is your first response, me, 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 mine, mine, mine? Or is it maybe God has something bigger than just that? I think Jesus is trying to get us to think in a fresh new way. This man in the story has a strategy. He determines, I'm going to make a response to make sure that I have everything I need for all of my life and X, you know, X times more, way, way more than what I need. Then he has another internal conversation where he says, and now I can eat, I can drink, I can be merry, I can just coast the rest of my life. Just put it in neutral and coast. And, and Jesus is trying to get us to look and say, what, what if we get to that place where we could just coast? I wonder if that's the best life, the best way to invest the one life God's given us to live on this earth. And then God declares and questions. God declares, you've responded in a poor way, in a foolish way. And your life is just coming to an end. Now, this is not a, some people will read this and go, so God's threatening, if I'm, if I'm selfish, he's going to kill me? No, that's not, the point of the, that's not the point of the story. It's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, this guy, all he thinks about is himself, and the way he goes, he ends up squandering everything he has because he doesn't, he's going to use it all on himself, but he never uses it on himself either. He loses it all. And so Jesus says, stop and think in a different way. And then there's what I call a profound declaration. Here's what Jesus says. At the, now, the story's over. And Jesus says, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. Oh, how do I interpret this? Well, generally, you should interpret something, ready for this, this profound theological insight? You should interpret it the way Jesus interprets it. If Jesus takes the time to give you an interpretation, if Jesus takes the time to say, oh, by the way, this is what I mean, then we can go, oh, hey, that's what Jesus means. So, so he's, he's, saying, he's addressing the issue of saying, when I bless you, when I lavish you and bless you, and mo I, I would dare to say all of us here are blessed in some way. We might not be all blessed with lots of money, but if, if, you live, if you live where we live in Monterey, if you have three meals a day and an occasional snack along the way, if you have two or three sets of clothing and a place to live every night, if you have clean running water, then you're, you're probably in the top 15% of the wealthy people on the entire planet. I've been to El Salvador, I've been to Honduras, I've been places in the world where people are dirt poor. You go to India and people live with literally nothing their whole life. They're born in poverty, they live in poverty, they die in poverty. So we have to also get perspective. Because some of us go, well, I never, I'm never lavish with good things so I could never share. It's like, time out. <laughs> I, remember, I remember when a woman who was part of our church who lived, she always kind of lived on the, on the edges. She would, originally lived in a trailer that was just some of the trailers she parked around Monterey where they'll park and they'll have to move every so often and kind of live in the trailer. She kinda, that was how she was living. But when she became a Christian and then when she got a part-time job and started working to earn some income, she came to me one Sunday right, right here. I, was, I sit down here usually on Sunday mornings after services and I talk and pray with people. And she came up, and this is a person, when she became a Christian, she wouldn't walk anywhere. She'd kind of like skip and dance. She was probably in her 30s or so, but she, would like, she was just kind of like always, she was always like moving, like skipping and dancing and moving around, just so happy and in love with Jesus. And she came kind of skipping, dancing and running up to me. And she said, Pastor Kevin, she said, I got my paycheck and I got some money and there's supposed to be rain coming up this next week. So I bought some tarps. Because I have some friends of mine who are really poor. Now, most people would look at her and say, she's really poor. She said, I have some friends of mine that are poor. She said, I bought these blue tarps so that when it rains, I can bring it to them and they can cover themselves and they won't get wet because they're living on the streets still. They're living in the shrubs and the bushes and the streets. Her response to God's lavish blessing was to go to Home Depot and buy three or four tarps to help cover her friends up. And you know what she thought to herself? I'm rich. Some of us wait to be generous until we get rich and we forget that we're already rich in some measure, in some way. You're rich if you have enough to share something with somebody else. Do you do that? Do you respond that way? So Jesus says, he says and, then, and then sometimes our first response is, what about all about me, but what about God? What about blessing God and giving things back to God, the one who's given me everything I have? And so the heart of the parable, what's the heart of this parable? I would put it this way. You could hoard everything for yourself and watch an epic backfire. It's gonna, if, you, if everything's always about me, all my life, me, 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 mine, 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 you're, you're always going to find an epic backfire. Your relational world may blow up. Your financial world may blow up. Your emotional, so, but, but, but if, if your whole life is consumed with consuming and all about me, at some point, it's gonna, things are going to blow up. 
Or you can be generous with all you have and all you are and bless God and the people around you. And in that blessing of other people, I think we find more joy in what we have. I think we find more meaning and purpose in life. And I always remind people when I talk about anything about generosity, especially in the church, that if the giving at Shoreline tripled or quadrupled, I would not get a penny more. I get, a certain, I get paid a certain amount. That's my pay. I don't work on commissions. I don't work on bonuses. I don't work on percentages of the offering. Uh, I want to see people find freedom in Christ and meaning in life. And I believe that comes when we live the way Jesus calls us to live. And one of the things is that we live with joyful generosity. So if you want to lock away a couple lessons in your heart and your mind, I want to give a couple light before. In just a moment, we're going to come to the table and we're going to share communion. You want to talk about if I've been blessed. The body of Christ was broken for me. The blood of Christ was shed for me to cleanse my sins. I've been blessed. Just that right there is enough for eternity. But here's some lessons out of this parable. Life lesson number one. Beware when you have plenty and blessings abound. Beware. You say, well, no, that's a good thing when I have a lot and I get more. Well, maybe, but be careful. Watch your heart. Watch your mind. So here's a question. When I have extra, is my focus on me or thee? Capital T. Is my folk, when, I, when, I, when I'm doing well, when I have extra, is my first response, what can I do for me or what can I do for thee? Right? And just ask yourself that. Watch yourself this week when you get a little something extra. What's your first response? Me or thee? And just let God speak to your heart about that. Lesson number two. Life lesson number two. Pay attention to your internal dialogue. What are you saying to yourself? In this parable twice, This man that Jesus tells about in the parable talks to himself. He's thinking through. What shall I do? How shall I handle this? I know what I'll do. I'll build build bigger bigger barns. Then I can say, you know, so he's having this internal dialogue. What's your internal dialogue like about stuff, about material things? What's going through your mind? Oh, I can't wait till I get more because then I can get me this and then I can get me that. And I got my list of 14 things and then I'm not happy. And then when I get that, I'm not happy. But oh, but then I'll get that. Then I'll be, you know, what's, what's, or, or, or you find yourself thinking, oh, Lord, if I were to have a little bit more, I could help with this mission organization. I could help with our student ministries. If I had a little bit more, I could walk down the road and see a need and respond to it. If I had a little bit more, I could be at a restaurant. And so I could be there working, somebody actually working at a restaurant. It happens sometimes. Right now, you go, almost everyone's understaffed everywhere. So when somebody's actually working... What if you were to say, hey, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for working hard. And instead of giving you know, a 15% tip, you give a 50% tip or 100% tip. Wouldn't it be great if you had enough to do that? Well, you might if it's maybe never crossed your mind, right? <laughs> and so, so what's your internal dialogue like? And question number two then because am I asking bigger questions? Here's the small question. What else can I do for me? That's easy. Here's a bigger question. What can I do to glorify God? What can I do to bless other people in the name of Jesus? Life lesson number three. Have a strategy when it comes to acquiring stuff. I want to encourage you to have a strategy when it comes to material stuff. Where you say, I have a way I want to respond, a way I want to handle things. And and here's a question that I think most of us don't ask, ask ourselves an answer, but I think all of us should. Here's question number three. How much is enough for me? How much is enough for me? Sharon and I have talked about this through the years. When we lived in Michigan, we had a kind of a point where we said, that's enough for us. And we hit a certain point where any more that came in, we knew it wasn't for us because we had enough. And God gave us more than we needed. Then we moved to Monterey. We didn't have enough again because it's really expensive to live here. But over time, we got to the point where we were like, okay, we're okay, we're okay, we have enough for us again. Now if God gives us more, we can be more generous. And God has given us more. And we've been able to be more generous. But we had kind of a plan in our minds. How much is enough? For you, what if you were to teach your kids growing up? And to young people here, young people, I mean anybody in their 20s or younger. You look and say, well, I'm, I'm struggling to get enough. Okay, but, but do you know what enough is? Because if you don't know what enough is, guess what? You never get there. Never. And also, a question you ask is, how much is enough? Is 90% of what I earn enough for me? Why do I say 90%? Because the Bible talks about committed Christians will take the first 10% and give it to God's work. The first 10%? Well, that's why it's the first 10%. If I give God my last 10%, I'll never have anything to give. If I give, my first, give God my first 10%, which I've been doing since before I married Sherry, and we've been doing it together since we've been married, and we give, it all, we give it actually to Shoreline, and then if we give more, which we do by God's grace, not bragging, just saying we love to give, then we give it to other ministries. But we know 90% is enough. Why? Because we've always lived on 90%. Why? Because 10% goes to God. And then 
there's a point where you say, then now do I have enough of that 90%? Maybe, I, I had a friend who said, if I don't give 55 to 60% of what I earn away, I'm not honoring God. Why? He says, God just put on my heart. I, that's how I'm supposed to live. Now, his 45% was more than most of our 100% will ever be. So he was fine. Don't worry about that guy. But, that, but that's what God called him to do. Grab, you know, think about those things. And then lesson number four. Invest aggressively, strategically, and joyfully in the things of God. Jesus is saying, be careful that it's not just about me, but that I think about eternal things. So here's the last question. Question number four. What are the things of God? What does it mean to invest in the things of God? Here's my three suggestions. The ministry of the church, reaching lost people who don't know Jesus, missions around the world and around our community, and the glory of God. How do I invest in things that will strengthen the church and strengthen God's people? How do I invest in things that will help people come to know Jesus? And how do I invest in things that will bring God glory? Now, why do I say those things are things of God? Because those are things that last forever. People last forever. God lasts forever. His work in the world that goes on for, you know, forever and what we do makes an impact. So ask yourself, am I investing in things that actually last forever? And if you are, praise the Lord. So let this story just be locked to your heart and in your mind and let Jesus challenge you between you and him. And when that internal dialogue starts, ask yourself, am I thinking about me or thee? Am I thinking in a biblical way or in a, in a personal way? Jesus, this is our prayer tonight that this story would be locked to our souls, that this story would help us to understand that you, Jesus, are the provider of all good gifts, of everything that we need. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that we will learn to delight in what you've given to us, to appreciate it greatly, but to live with generous hearts and generous spirits. Let your message of truth and let your word be alive in our hearts. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, I invite you to prepare your hearts to partake in communion. As you came in, you should have gotten a little communion cup. If you didn't, we're going to have some people walk along the aisles right now and just kind of raise your hand and look to either aisle, and they will just hand one down to you, maybe toss one to you. And so as they, as they walk along, if you see them, just give them a little wave, and they'll give you a communion cup. If you're at home, would you get yourself some grape juice or a little, little bit of wine or grape juice, a bread or a cracker or uh, something that, you know, some, uh, something that would be good to, just to represent the body of Christ and the blood of Christ? And I'd ask you to listen to the scriptures. Listen to 1 Corinthians 11 as we prepare our hearts to come to the table. Jesus spoke these words. I'm sorry, the Apostle Paul spoke these words. For I received from the Lord what I passed on also to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So those of you on campus, I can tell, are already getting the elements ready for yourself, which is great. If you're not doing that yet, you're going to notice on the little, little cup you have, it's a little tricky. There's a layer that you pull off, and then there's a little wafer there. Hold that in one hand, and then peel off the next layer. Don't squeeze the cup too hard. It's very soft. And you don't want to... And so you peel that one off, and then have the cup ready in one hand, and the, the wafer in the other. If you're at home, I'm sure by now you've already grabbed your elements, and you're ready to partake with us. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you have come to the cross and received Jesus Christ then we invite you to partake in communion. This is not the table of Shoreline Church. This is the table of Jesus. So if you're a, a Bible-believing Christian who's following Jesus, this is for you. And so we invite you to get ready. If you're not yet a follower of, Christ, of Jesus, if you're online or here on our campus, and you say, I'm here today, but I haven't yet really accepted Jesus as my Savior, my encouragement is you would just partake by watching those around you. And then you can partake physically with the elements when it makes sense to you, when you actually understand what this means. So if you're a believer, this is for believers. If you're not, just refrain, but partake by kind of watching those around you and just seeing what God is doing in our hearts and our lives. And as we prepare to partake, we remember Jesus. We remember the power of his life that he came to this earth. And he had compassion and he served well and he loved well and he loved us so much that he was willing to go to a cross to die for us. But he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. And we get to celebrate and reflect in this moment that he is still living and active in our lives today. Yeah. So when we come to the table, we remember Jesus. 
we also reflect on our own hearts and our own lives. At the cross, we remember the price he paid for our sins. So if we've wandered back into sin, if we've got patterns of sin in our lives, this is a perfect time. Right now, as you hold the bread that reminds us of his body, as you hold the cup that reminds you of his blood, it's the perfect time to say, Jesus, search my heart. If there's things I need to confess to you, things I need to lay down, things I need to turn away from to repent of, let this be the moment. But we don't come to the table. We don't come to communion saying, I'm perfect and righteous, I deserve this. We come saying, I don't deserve this. It's here in this reminder that I understand that I needed grace and I still do. So bring your sins before the Lord, but don't feel like you have to come perfect. Come with sins confessed and a heart yielded, but ready to receive from Jesus. Communion is one of the most beautiful moments, I really believe, in the lives of us Christians. Because we get together, we get to come together in community. Just as a body of believers, just reflecting on what Jesus did. And we come in this community with Jesus. And as you all hold that little cup in your hand with the wafer, I just want to ask you, just reflect in this moment what that means. His body that was broken for you. His blood that was poured out for you. So that you can have life. And whether you're at home or here in the worship center, uh, take the bread that you have or the wafer in your hand and just remember as you look at that that this bread which we break is our communion with the broken body of Jesus. In just a moment, in just a moment when we partake of this, we are remembering that his body was broken to make us whole. His life was laid down to give us life. And his perfection takes our sin and washes it away. Let's take this bread Let's partake of it, and let's remember the price of the broken body of Jesus for us. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is the blood of my new covenant. This, is, this cup represents the blood of the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. His blood that was poured out for you on that cross so you could be set free and that you could have new life and have it to the full. Drink this in remembrance of him. Lord Jesus, for your broken body, for your shed blood, for the price that you paid to cleanse us of our sins, we give you praise. We thank you for your amazing grace and that by your death, we have life and that by your wounds, we are healed. And so Jesus, as we respond right now with the taste of the bread and the cup on our lips, the reminder that you fill us with your presence. Jesus, let our worship honor you. Let us lift up our voices and lift up our hearts and lift up our lives in this time. Unleash our praise and fill us with your presence. We pray this in your name. Amen.